Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Stavros Paspalis and I am the director of the Australian Archaeological Institute at Athens. The honour of welcoming you this afternoon falls to me and I would like to thank you for your attendance. I would particularly like to thank everybody who has come from interstate and regional New South Wales and our overseas attendees who are watching the live stream in a wide variety of time zones. I would like to extend a special welcome to the Chancellor of our University, Belinda Hutchinson, to Father Athenagoras, representing His Eminence Archbishop Makarios, Primate of the Greek Orthodox Church in Australia, and to Mr. Konstantinos Yanakodimos from the uh, Greek Consulate in Sydney, representing the uh, Consul General, Mr. Christos Karas. For those of you who use a hearing aid, we have installed a hearing loop for this event. Please switch your hearing devices to the T position and let a staff member know if you experience any difficulties. Before we begin the proceedings, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. It is upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. As we share our own knowledge, teaching, learning and research practices within this university, may we also res pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. I would like to call on the Chancellor of our university, Ms. Belinda Hutchinson, to deliver her opening address. Thank you, Stavros, and I would like to add my acknowledgement of the Gadigal people and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. It is on the lands of the, at Gadigal people that the McLaurin Hall is situated. And Indigenous peoples have been teaching and learning here for tens of thousands of years, and we try to carry on their wonderful tradition. So welcome everybody to this celebration of the life of one of the university's truly international and inspirational figures. Professor Alexander Kambitoglu Ao was an overachiever and we are all so grateful that was the case. Once he set his mind on a goal, he followed it meticulously to absolutely guarantee that the goal he set would be met. The positive impact which he made to academia and well beyond, not only nationally but also internationally, is keenly appreciated by all of us at our university and, and beyond. The list of the rewards, awards he received is very long and it culminated with his award of the Australian AO in 1987. Alexander commenced his teaching positions at universities in the United States of America following his education in the United Kingdom and Greece. Consequently, when he attended an, at the University of Sydney in the early 1960s, he had lived in a number of different countries and had been exposed to a wide range of very different cultures. It was this international dimension that he brought to Australia and here it was that he wedded it to his quickly developing love of our country, which fortunately for us was the reason he decided to settle here permanently. Alexander was appointed senior lecturer in classical archaeology at our university in 1961 and attained the position of professor of classical archaeology only two years later in 1963. He held the chair from 1978 as the Sir Arthur and René George Professor of Classical Archaeology, and he held that until 1989. Needless to say, the department bore his imprint for many years as he was instrumental in determining its makeup, and he worked closely with his colleagues in Near Eastern and Classical Archaeology to create a challenging and rewarding learning experience for the department's students. Along with his teaching position, Alexander was also the curator of the Nicholson Museum until 2000. 
ever the educator, he took the characteristically bold step of, of closing down the museum for four years, from 1962 to 1966, so that it could be thoroughly redesigned, and of course to his specification, as a major teaching institution and of, of our collections, a collection from which generations of our students have benefited. It was such a pity that Alexander was not well enough to be involved with the planning of the Chow Chak Wing Museum, but I was pleased to learn that he really appreciated the opportunities that our new museum would bring for greater public engagement and educational experiences. I'm sure he would have loved seeing the way the new building showcases classical archaeology that was so important in his life. Beyond his teaching responsibilities on campus, Alexander initiated Australian excavations in Greece at Zagora on the island of Andros in 1967 and at Turone on the northern Aegean coast in 1975. There were, these were major undertakings at a time when international travel was not second nature to many Australians. There were also very important research projects which contributed greatly to the field of classical archaeology and through which scores of University of Sydney students and staff and others received an amazing and invaluable training in the field. The educational dimension of the field projects that Alexander directed cannot be overestimated. Many Australian students went on to become professional archaeologists and owe a great deal of their experience and their careers to the work they did at Zagora and Torone. And there were many others who didn't go on to pursue a career in archaeology. But what an amazing experience to be able to go on field work like that, to build networks of friends and colleagues and absolutely learn about teamwork and everything else that goes with that. Alexander managed so much because he was particularly adept at engaging public support for his many projects. He understood the importance of presenting the results of research to the public who were fascinated by his informative presentations on ancient Greek and beyond, Greece and beyond. He was a master storyteller and he really brought the ancient world to life. His public outreach resulted in the formation of decades-long friendships with supporters and he was always the first to say it was his supporters that made his many achievements possible. Alexander was an untiring promoter of Australian research in Greece, and in 1980 he established the Australian Archaeolo Archaeological Institute in Athens, a centre of the university. This is now one of the established foreign schools in Greece and through which Australians can apply to the Greek Ministry of Culture for permission to conduct fieldwork and which facilitates the research of Australian students and academics in myriads of ways. This is truly Alexander's living legacy, which he ensured would continue with the very generous bequest he left for our university on his passing. Thank you so much for coming here and joining us today. It is so important that we honour one of the greatest and much loved academic leaders of our university. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. As we heard, Alexander Kumbhidaglu arrived in Sydney in 1961. But he had, of course, a rich life prior to taking up a lectureship in classical archaeology at our university that year. Alexander had been born as the youngest of four children into a well-to-do mercantile family in Thessaloniki, a city which only 10 years before his birth had been incorporated into the Greek state. In February 1922, the month of Alexander's birth, it was a very different city to the one it is today. The influx of Greek and other Christian refugees and then exchangees from Asia Minor had not as yet taken place, 
nor had the Muslim component of the city's population been sent eastwards. And Thessaloniki's large Jewish community was still thriving. This was the environment, the milieu, in which his parents were raised. His father's family originated in the town of Veria, to the, east of Thessalonik to the west sorry, of Thessaloniki, but had moved to the metropolis a few generations earlier, and there had acquired the Ottoman suffix of Oglu. The family name, Kambitis, which literally means man from the plain, and indeed Veria, sits on a highland ridge which overlooks the extensive Macedonian plain, became Kambitoglu. The family clearly prospered, and Alexander's father was a successful leather merchant trading well into Europe. Alexander's mother's family had yet deeper roots in Thessaloniki and belonged to the upper reaches of the Greeks of the city's Greek community. The family could afford to send Alexander's maternal grandfather to Germany for his tertiary education. He had been sent to pursue medical studies, but while abroad, Alexander's grandfather was convinced that he would be more effective by becoming a teacher, and so he became one of Thessaloniki's foremost Greek educators. Education clearly was a major concern of Alexander's family, and his parents were in the happy position of being able to provide the best, so much so that he had a French nanny from a young age. Consequently, he acquired French very early on. Indeed, the acquisition of languages was a leitmotif throughout his life. On completing school, Alexander entered the University of Thessaloniki, from where he graduated in 1946. Of course, in the immediately preceding years, he, along with millions of others, was subjected to the horrors of World War II. He lost his eldest brother, whom he often recalled fondly, early, when Greece successfully repulsed Mussolini's assault. But the failed Italian invasion and the German descent, and between, sorry, the failed Italian invasion and the German descent into Greece, Alexander was a Red Cross volunteer. He did not dwell on his World War II reminiscences, though he did, of course, live through the occupation, the famines, the requisitioning of properties, the forced billeting of occupation soldiers in the family home, and the extermination of Thess Thessaloniki's Jewish community. We should not forget these dark times in Alexander's life. However, the most he would say was that he feared that the level of his German was not what it should have been because of what he had experienced and seen during the occupation. That said, however, Alexander did not hold any grudges. His admiration for German scholarship remained with him throughout his life, and a simple perusal of the list of the Institute's visiting professors whom Alexander invited to tour Alex Australia suffices to show how highly he valued his German colleagues, both as scholars and individuals. What may not be widely known are Alexander's literary interests. These were born and developed in Thessaloniki, and he was an active member in its literary salons, establishing relationships with a number of writers and artists. And he extended his network to Athens as well. Alexander's intense interest in literature remained with him throughout his life. It was, however, to the study of the ancient world to which he dedicated himself. In 1946, Alexander's academic promise was recognized by the award of a British Council scholarship, which allowed him to study in the UK. He firstly went to Manchester, where he studied under TBL Webster, whom he followed to, the university, to University College London, where he received a doctorate, working alongside Webster and Martin Robinson. Thereafter, he went to Oxford, where he honed his skills as regards the study of ancient Greek vase painting, uh, particularly those of um, Athens, and even more so those of southern Italy. Later, he had a very fruitful collaboration with Arthur Dale Trendle, which led to their monumental studies of the red figure vessels of Apulia. And to the end of his days, Alexander impressed on all who would listen the immeasurable contribution Trendle made in the field of ancient Mediterranean studies in Australia. After fulfilling his military service obligations in Greece, 
Alexander took up his first teaching post in the University of Mississippi in 1954, an alien world which, from the stories he would later relate, with a degree of amazement, disapproval, and affection, intrigued him. From there, he moved to the prestigious Bryn Mawr College, just outside Philadelphia, where he taught for five years before moving to Sydney. It was while he was at Bryn Mawr that he received his second doctorate, this time from Oxford. I am certain that Alexander's impact in Australia will be detailed by other speakers this afternoon. His teaching and research, his establishment on the first Australian excavations in Greece, his revitalization of the then Nicholson Museum, and of course his foundation of the Australian Archaeological Institute at Athens. His dedication to his two homelands, Greece and Australia, was absolute. Alexander was aided in the monumental tasks he took on by close friends and supporters, foremost among whom was the late Professor John Young, Alexander's firm partner in all his endeavours. There were many others too, of course. Alexander had a knack of inspiring dedicated supporters, and with their help he moved mountains. He revitalised the Friends of the Nicholson Museum, and for the promotion of Australian archaeological expeditions in Greece, he and his numerous supporters in 1967 established the Association for Classical Archaeology and its vitally important Ladies Committee, which raised funds by various means, the most notable of which were the chamber music concerts held in the Great Hall for 29 consecutive years. Alexander would be the first to inform us that none of these achievements would have been possible without the help of many dedicated supporters, but the vision was his. Major as Alexander's impact is in Australia, it is by no means limited to our shores. His academic contribution is recognised internationally, but it was recognised with a particular cadence in Greece. Early in his career, he had become a member of the Athens Archaeological Society, and in 1994, he was elected a member of the Academy of Athens, the pinnacle of the country's academic establishment. This was not just an august honour. It was also a position of responsibility, which brought many duties with it, all of which Alexander executed with his characteristic thoroughness. In 1998, the Order of the Phoenix was bestowed upon him by the President of Greece. And of course, he received many other awards and honours, both in Greece and Australia. His network of friends in Greece, in the universities, the Archaeological Society of Athens, the Ministry of Culture, and other foreign institutes and the wider public was impressive. The establishment of the Archaeological Museum in Chora on Andros, in which finds from the Zagora excavations are so successfully displayed, was in no small part owed to his contacts and friendship as well as his perseverance. Personally, I will remember Alexander best as a teacher, and not just in the lecture hall. At every interaction, be it in the university, on excavation, or at a social event, Alexander had the ability of imparting insights, the relevance of which may not have been Im immediately apparent, but which became so as time passed. I am certain that many of you who will know Many of you here will know what I mean. Alexander offered opportunities, and graciously so. The careers of a good number of Australians would have looked very different had Alexander not arrived here in 1961, as would the discipline of classical archaeology in our country. If Alexander were here, I am certain that he would want to thank a large number of people who aided him in seeing his visions come to fruition. Such a list would be extensive, an indication of the man's impact. It would include staff members who typically were inspired by his commitment to work well beyond normal expectations, academic and departmental colleagues, as well as supporters from the wider community, foremost those in the Institute's friends organisations that were established throughout Australia and in Athens. Many of the friends he would thank are in this hall this afternoon. Others are following proceedings from afar, yet more are no longer with us. Women and men from a wide range of backgrounds who gave of their time, expertise and resources to help Alexander promote Greek and Mediterranean studies in Australia and to disseminate the results of world-class 
uh, Australian research internationally. Alexander's legacy is multifaceted, and the Australian Archaeological Institute at Athens, with its nationwide membership, very much continues his vision in today's ever-changing environment. Alexander Kambitoglu's life was one of struggles, commitment, and achievements. His legacy is, to quote, as I have done on previous occasions, in the words of Thucydides, Actima es ai, a possession for all time. Thank you. I would like now to invite Emeritus Professor Diana Wood Conroy uh, from the University of Wollongong to share, to share her reminiscences of Alexander Kambitoglu with us. Diana. Thank you, Stavros. It's wonderful to see so many friends and colleagues here today. Alexander Kambitoglu has been a memorable shaping presence in my long life since 1962 when I was an 18-year-old student of archaeology. I graduated with honors in 1966. Here I speak for the generations of people who studied with him. At that time, I had never envisaged anyone like Professor Kampitoglu. He demonstrated that Greek vase painting was at the highest arc of meticulous scholarship. He loved theater and art and spoke many languages fluently. The knowledge I absorbed was narrowly focused and detailed, yet placed in a vast scope of time and place, so that one learned to speak of the second millennium BC or the third quarter of the sixth century and became familiar with previously unknown geographies. Alexander was the overarching voice, a classical voice, in my years in the department, together with the young lecturers, Judy Birmingham and Vincent McGaw, and a few years later, Richard Green. Alexander appeared in the lecture theater, formidably upright in a flowing black gown holding a long wooden pointer and giving dense presentations of paired slides that we had to memorize for later examination. From him, I learnt to dissect an image in all its complex visuality, to scrutinize every aspect of that mysterious quality of style so that you could identify whole categories of painted vases through the specific representation of a hand, a foot, or drapery. Later, in my decades of teaching visual arts at the University of Wollongong, I returned to these basics of looking as the grounding for art theory and indeed for indigenous visual cultures. The 1960s was an electrifying time of change. Germaine Greer strode across the quadrangle like an armed Athena, followed by her acolytes. The Union Theatre produced radical plays by Durenmatt or Beckett. Onisoir challenged censorship laws. As curator of the Nicholson Museum, our Professor Alexander was part of that ferment to modernize and uproot old certainties. He inherited a museum which was as cluttered as a Victorian living room and eventually honed it to a white, well-lit space of glowing vitrines, set aside, setting aside the teeming gravestones, the gruesome Egyptian body parts, and the plaster casts of innumerable deities. Some of these have crept back into the Chow Chuck Wing Museum. It was my job as his assistant to unpack boxes sent decades earlier from Egypt and Europe and discover tantalizing objects such as sarcophagus sculptures in fragments or lead votive figurines from the temple of Artemis Orthia in Sparta 
and research their provenance and date in old excavation reports in the Fisher stacks. Some of these treasures are now on display in the Chow Chak Wing Museum and still look the same while I have aged. Writing the texts for the new glass cases meant sometimes excruciating sessions with Alexander correcting my grammar. Shouldn't that be a gerund, Miss Wood, he might say. I learned how to write simple description, which turned out to be not so simple at all. A few years ago, I showed Alexander a newspaper cutting from 1964, and he exclaimed, those were the good times. With Alexander's help, I was resident at the British School of Archaeology in Athens after graduating. His kind sister, with whom I spoke halting French, fed me prodigious meals. And when Alexander visited Athens, he would take me for a glamorous coffee near the parliament. I went to Athens to study connections between classical and contemporary art in what was to be a lifelong preoccupation. Later, in 1995, I would stay at the Australian Institute, set up through Alexander's agency, and it was a marvelous feeling to have that familiar base. In 1967, I helped architect Jim Colton and Alexander survey the glorious site of Zagara in Athens. And again, in 1973, I was the archeological illustrator in a study season of Menetes that included Richard Green. It was very moving to return once more to Andros and Zagara in 2012 with Alexander, with Meg Miller, Leslie Beaumont, and many people who are here today including Stavros. Being an Andros brought back memories for Alexander, and when we had a quiet dinner together one night, he told me heart-rending stories of Nazi-occupied Thessaloniki when he was a schoolboy. When I myself became a professor in 2006, I visited him to tell him what an influence he'd been. His disciplined example of systematic scholarship, his love of art and awareness of the international scope of archaeology between Greece and Australia impelled me, I think, to foster artist residencies from the University of Wollongong with the Australian Archaeological Institute in Athens. This was a small homage to his example working closely with Beatrice McLaughlin, Wayne Mullen, and Stavros Paspalis. I will never forget Alexander's exceptional way of being in the world, his dignitas, his voice, his gestures, even his bow ties. He was a driving force in my life, and I miss him very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. It's now my pleasure to invite to the lectern, um, in succession, um, Emeritus Professors Graham Clark and Elizabeth Minchin from the Australian National University in Canberra. Graham. I've been asked to speak on Alexander's public achievement, so inevitably there is going to be some repetition, for which I apologize. <clears throat> if towards the end of his long life, Alexander had been asked to reflect on his public achievements and to select three of which he was most proud, I'm sure they would be these. Firstly, the establishment of the Australian Archaeological Institute at Athens in 1980, 
now over 40 years ago. Alexander was an internationalist and he was acutely aware that by its establishment, Australia joined 18 other foreign schools and institutes in Athens. On an equal footing, the institute combining Alexander's twin identities as a Greek and as an Australian. He was fully aware that such foreign schools not only fostered Greek studies and Greek research among Australians, especially but by no means exclusively in archaeology, but it also enabled appreciation of Australian scholarly and cultural achievements within Greece. To do so, he instituted a series of scholarships and bursaries, an Australian contemporary creative residency, and an annual visiting professorship within Australia. Well-intentioned attempts have been made to establish similar Australian studies centres elsewhere in the Mediterranean and the Levant, in Syria, in Cyprus, in Italy, but all have ultimately failed. It is thanks to Alexander's persistence, his very hard work and lobbying, he was the Institute's director for its first 37 years, and above all, his financial generosity that the AAIIA flourishes today and still remains the only established Australian foreign school anywhere. Secondly, Alexander initiated in the 1960s Australian excavations in Greece, most particularly from 1967 onwards into the 1970s at the important geometric 9th, 8th century site of Zagora on the island of Andros, along with the establishment of the archaeological museum on that island where many of the finds are held and for which he was the co-author of its guide. The work of Professor Meg Miller and her associates continues to reveal the importance and richness of the site. And then from the mid-1970s, work was commenced at the multi-period site of Tyrone in the Chalcidice. Publications from those excavations already realised and forthcoming, have established Australian classical archaeology on the international map. And importantly, these excavations have trained generations of Australian students in classical archaeology. And lastly, the Nicholson Museum. Alexander assumed responsibility of the museum in 1962, and when in 1963 he became professor of classical archaeology at Sydney University, he was appointed honorary curator of the Nicholson as well. He continued in this role for the next 37 years until the year 2000. He totally reorganised and refurbished the collection, importantly oversaw its acquisition policies and turned what he had inherited as a mis miscellaneous holdings of antiquities into a world-class university classical collection, by far the strongest in the country. Publications of its holdings in two Nicholson Museum fascicules in the prestigious series 
Corpus Thousorum Antiquorum with Michael Turner and a volume on classical art in the Nicholson Museum with Ted Robinson, along with 40 years of collaboration with Dale Trendle on the red figure vases from southern Italy and a myriad of associate publications, I count at least 20 monographs of which Alexander was either sole author, co-author or editor, has left the scholarly world an enduring legacy of which Alexander was justly proud. In recent years, whenever I turned up for meetings of the Council of the Australian Archaeological Institute at Athens and was greeted by Alexander, I would ask him how he was faring. And he would invariably claim, in reply, with an expressive shrug of his shoulders, we are not immortal. I think you would concur that with this scholarly legacy and having managed to live until the course of his 98th year, Alexander did his humanly best to negate that claim. Alexander Awe Atque Wale. Stavros has asked me to speak about the friends groups uh, that have been established across Australia and, of course, in Greece. The birth of the new Australian Archaeological Institute at Athens in 1980 was not easy when, after several approaches, the Australian government declined to make any funding commitment at all to the Institute Alexander did not give up, demonstrating a truly commendable streak of creative persistence. He, as founding director, set about building a network of support. This network uniquely links academic institutions and the community in a number of so-called friends groups in major cities across Australia and indeed also in Athens. It will not surprise those who knew him when I say that Alexander had very firm ideas about the composition of these friends groups and about a desirable program of activities. He envisaged that each of these groups would be made up of both Australians and, and this was very important to him, and Greek Australians. The focus of each group, uh, the focus of each group's activities would be local on the one hand and international on the other. At the local level, the friends would host, and this is Alexander's instructions, the friends would host an annual lecture program which would address archaeological work across the ancient Greek world and other broadly related topics. The outcome of this policy is that the work of the AAIA and of Australian scholars whose research focus in, is Greece, ancient or modern, has been and continues to be communicated to an interested public across Australia and in Greece. In accordance with Alexander's vision, the Friends Groups raise funds through their activities to support the Institute more generally and specifically to fund a travel award for a local scholar whose research requires a period in Greece. The Canberra Friends, for example, since the early 90s, have offered a biennial award that has taken PhD students across several disciplinary areas early career researchers and conservation students and practitioners to Greece. 
this in-country experience has been invaluable to each and every one of them. It is good for them and it is ultimately good for the rest of us. But this traffic was not to be one way. Alexander knew the benefit of bringing to Australia each year a distinguished international scholar who might spend time at all the centres where friends groups had been established and who would offer public lectures for the wider community and seminars for academic colleagues. The annual Australian tour by each visiting professor has been funded over the years by a number of generous donors who have been inspired by Alexander's vision. Alexander's proposals for the composition and functions of these friends groups were carefully thought through. He was always ready to offer encouragement and advice and he gave generously of his own time and energy to help build and maintain networks. In Canberra, for example, our ANU-based friends group has enjoyed valuable support, thanks to Alexander, from the Embassy of Greece, the Cypriot High Commission, and the Greek community, imp importantly uh, from the Hellenic Club of Canberra. Our lectures and our annual dinner have achieved wonderfully well what I believed Alexander desired above all. They have brought together in a common venture a supportive community of Greek Australians and Australian Philhellenes. Thank you. I would like to invite to the lectern Professor Alistair Blanchard from the University of Queensland. Alistair. Over the last couple of days, I've been thinking a lot about the differences between philanthropy, ancient and modern. Um, let, let me give you an example. We have a lovely inscription from the second century BC Asia Minor that records the arrangements that were made following the death of one of their great civic benefactors. It records that following their death, a festival was organized at which there were sacrificed 100 oxen, 24 sheep, 24 goats. There was a dance number performed by the noble youths of the city. There were two choruses of maidens to sing appropriate songs. There was the erection of a statue and a monumental inscription on one of the largest buildings recording their philanthropy. And finally, there was a procession through the streets that culminated with yet more sacrifices and prayers and the establishment of a cult that ensured that the deceased could be worshipped as a semi-divine being for eternity. Now, I'm not sure what Alexander would have made of these ancient arrangements, but I think he rather would have liked them. And moreover, he would have thought them entirely appropriate. Um, and I'm totally with Alexander on this. To, to be honest, I think semi-divine honours is the least we can do. Many people used to describe Alexander as old-fashioned. And in this sense, he was tr that's true. He was an aristocrat in every sense of the word. Um, he was old-fashioned in the most wonderful way. And this was reflected in many ways, but for me, the significance really lies in the way that he was committed to advancing the common weal. He realized that philanthropy has the power to change lives. And he's right, and I know that because he changed mine. I can say with absolute sincerity that without Alexander, I would not be speaking to you today. It, it will amuse and possibly alarm a number of my Roman history colleagues that I once thought I was destined to be a Roman historian. I trained in my honors under a leading Roman social historian. I still regard my best undergraduate essay as one where I analyzed the early careers of Easterners who started their careers under the Emperor Domitian. However, all that changed one warm August night where in a stuffy, humid Brisbane classroom, I encountered a vision that if I close my eyes, I can still see it the sinuous, enticing contraposto forms of the Riace bronzes. One look at the beauty and lightness of touch 
that was statue A of the bronzes, and my heart was forever taken by Greece. The Riace bronzes were the topic of a lecture given by Professor John Barron, at that time newly appointed as Master of St. Peter's College at Oxford, and that year's AIA visiting professor. I don't know what John Barron made of Brisbane, but we made a lot of him. Even though this was the 90s, visits by international scholars of the quality of John Barron were pretty rare in Queensland. There was simply no way that any of us in Brisbane could have experienced exposure to such scholarship without the work of Alexander. And this wasn't just a one-off. Each year we were visited by leading figures of Greek archaeology. During my time as undergraduate, John Barron gave way to Erica Simon, to Herman Kienast, to Sarah Morris, all of the great luminaries of Greek archaeology. For three days every year, Brisbane felt like it was the center of some of the most cutting edge and important work in Greek archaeology. And here I want to pay tribute, as Elizabeth has done, to the breadth of Alexander's vision. It would have been very easy, very easy, to make his institute an exclusively Sydney or even just a Sydney University-based institution. But he never wanted that. He wanted to determine that it would be an institute for all Australia. The AIA excavations at Taroni always welcomed students from universities all over Australia. Each year, one of the great fundraising activities of the Classics Department and the Queensland Friends of the AIA was raising money to send uh, to Greece to work at Taroni and later places, Kithara, a student from the department. All over Australia, from Brisbane to Armadale to Perth to Adelaide to Hobart, students were enriched by the work of the Institute and given opportunities to learn about Greece and experience Greece in a way that would never have been possible for them. Like many of my contemporaries, my first visit to Greece involved staying in the AIA hospital. I remember the relief in finding it. Uh, Macriani wasn't the uh, glamorous spot that it is now. But I also remember the, welcome, the warmth of the welcome. Indeed, I think it had not been for the Institute's kindness, generosity and expertise, I would have formed a very different opinion of the city of Athens, a city that I'm now totally in love with. But as anyone will tell you, it's a very hard city to love on first encountering it. And I think if it had not been for the Athens staff of the AIA, I would have run from the city, and that would have been a huge personal loss for me. Even today, I think some of the most valuable work of the Institute uh, is the way that it builds bridges between Australian undergraduates and Greece. Every second year, my colleague Amelia Brown runs a summer school for our students in Greece. And this would not be possible without the assistance of the AIA in terms of negotiating guiding permits and site access. Yet these tours are transformational for our students. For many, it's their first trip overseas, and it's hard to overstate the profound effect this has. It's not only the intellectual delights of seeing objects in real life that they've only ever studied in books or on PowerPoint slides. It's the whole multi-sensory phenomenological experience of being in Greece. It's the ability to appreciate the landscape, the weather, the light, the distances, the smells, the culture, both ancient and modern. It's everything from seeing the Parthenon for the very first time to trying your first ever cherry tomato from Santorini and realizing as you bite into it that you've never tasted a proper tomato before. And again, all of this would not be possible without the work of the AIA and the local friends groups. The AIA facilitates research in Greece. And again, I'd like to pay tribute to the breadth of Alexander's vision. I'm not an archeologist, but Alexander always took a personal interest in my work. To be fair, I'm not really sure that he ever understood what it was. Um, I remember once trying to explain to him a research project I was working on, and I was reminded, ah, oh, yes, Things of the Bedroom, which um, I always thought would be quite a nice title for a book, actually. Um, but, but, but that didn't matter. I was a serious scholar, and serious scholars does, should be supported. And again, it's worth noting the wonderful way that he supported research and the Institute supports research. It's not only through its archeological excavations, but it's through brokering access to material objects and images for research. 
I've always been amazed by the Institute's ability to get me into places that I thought impossible to get access to or provide me with access to images for publications that I'd never thought I'd get in a million years. My life and the lives of so many others have been made fuller and richer by an institute that was the product of the drive, vision, and determination of one man. A man who decided to use his tremendous capacities, intellectual abilities, talents for charming university administrators, breadth of vision, and it must be said, own financial resources, to bring about the foundation of an institute that normally requires the effort of a wing of government or the exercise of a power of a monarch. Alexander straddled two worlds, lauded with the highest honours both in Greece, the place of his birth, and Australia, the place he chose to call home. In doing so, he managed to bring Australia and Greece closer together. On behalf of the many generations of Hellers, uh, the many Hellers of my generation, I would like to pay tribute to the tremendous work of this man. Thank you. And I'd like to call on our final speaker this afternoon, Professor Stephen Garton, Principal Advisor to the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Sydney. Stephen. So colleagues, friends and former students of Alexander, uh, the problem about being the last speaker is it's all been said. The career's been done the achievements have been um, noted. So I hope you'll um, forgive a certain self-indulgence of personal anecdote um, in this particular talk. So I first um, met Alexander, although met's probably the wrong word. Like Diana, I sat in a lecture um, almost 50 years ago, so it's, yeah. And there was that wooden stave, that pointer, and you sat there mesmerised as the, he slammed the stave into the floor and the projectionist up the back would flash and suddenly the stave would point and you'd get the three minutes of discourse on each image, another click of the stave, another discourse for three minutes, another click of the stave, another discourse of three. It was absolutely mesmerising and in some ways had a profound influence without Alexander ever knowing on my life because I, I looked at the performance and I looked at the way in which he analysed images and I realised I wasn't an object person. I'm a text person. I'm a modern historian, I'm more comfortable with the text. But I had fantasies of being an archaeologist. But looking at Alexander, I realised that that was not for me. So it changed the course of my life um, in a very interesting way and I turned out to be a 19th and 20th century historian. But I really came to know Alexander um, a bit over 20 years ago when I became Dean of the Arts Faculty. And John Atherton Young, whom I sort of knew through academic board, um, insisted that Alexander needed to meet the new Dean and so the appointment was made and Alexander and John came in and we had the first of very many conversations. And of course, um, Alexander had a sense of where power lay in the institution, so he was immediately attempting to bring me into the workings of the institute, which he did um, extremely well. As a consequence, Alexander and I, for that next 20 years, met um, probably every six to eight weeks to discuss issues. He would walk in and say, I'm on my last legs, I may not last very much longer, so there are various things that you need to know. That happened every time for 20 years. <laughs> I was convinced he was going to be immortal. <laughs> And we, he would take me through all of the issues that he thought about the Institute, what was happening. And in minute detail, I had to understand every bit of property that he had bequeathed to the university, the user fruct arrangements, and everything that was in his will. And so we, I think I've got five versions of the will in my files. And I, 
I learned a few things about Alexander. One, I, found, I, I learned that he was extraordinarily stubborn. I mean, there was one way of doing things, and it was the Alexander way. But he was able to mask that stubbornness by an extraordinary charm. I mean, he was the most charming human being. He had a font of delightful anecdotes, some of them a bit naughty, um, but just wonderful way in which he enriched your life and enriched the conversation. And that way overcame all of your resistance to his plans and his way of doing things. He was incredibly tough on his staff. I was amazed um, how tough he was on his staff. But of course, his charm, um, they were amazingly loyal and amazingly dedicated and worked all the hours that God gives in order to fulfill the mission because he inspired people with a sense of the mission and the importance. And that was a, a wonderful attribute, although I always felt sorry for the staff. They worked so hard. Um, but it's that charm that overcame those things and drove him forward in many ways. And it opened up all sorts of opportunities for me as a, a modern historian. So he kept on dragging me off to Greece to open up various conferences and do various things. And he built wonderful um, friendships uh, with the ambassadors in Greece. Um, particular ambassador he became very close to was Jenny Bloomfield, um, and she's been a wonderful supporter of the Institute. I remember one time uh, the then Chancellor and Governor Dame Mari Bashir and I were opening um, the Alexander Conference that year, and uh, Alexander was whispering in Jenny's ear, and Jenny came across and said, Well, um, Governor, uh, Dame Mari, um, you should see the Acropolis Museum. Um, and she said, that would be wonderful. Um, what day do you have free? Well, it happened to be the only day that she was free was the day that it was closed. But no, of course, Alexander and the ambassador opened up all the doors and um, Dame Murray and myself managed to get our own personal tour of the Acropolis Museum with no one else other than the curators in the institution. On another occasion after one of those conferences, um, I think Alexander would have been in his 80s, um, easily in his 80s, we um, went off um, to Andros. And we arrived in the town and we walked down to the museum and we walk into the museum and we said, um, where, what floor is the Zagora um, material on? And the person behind the counter said, oh, you mean Professor Cambidoglu's material? And we said, yes. Oh, and by the way, this is Professor Cambidoglu. And she looked in extraordinary, just her eyes went to the back of her head and she ran out the door and left us standing there. We had no idea what was going on. Alexander hadn't been there since the 70s, and this is in the 2010, I think, or 2012. And she just ran. About five minutes later, she comes in sweating, and the mayor and the town clerk are following, and they say, Professor Cambidoglu, Professor Cambidoglu, um, the town is yours. Eat at any restaurant you wish, the taxis are free, everything's on um, the, the mayor's account. So his charm, his networks, his ability um, to um, extend friendship and build networks um, that supported his activities was remarkable. When I look back now um, at um, Alexander, I think um, Alistair said old fashioned. I, I think he's kind of was in his declining years a kind of archaeological um, exhibit himself. Um, he was a, a relic of an older generation of scholars. He was the quintessential God professor, but he had um, a real investment in what does it mean to be a professor 
It's about professing the discipline. So he was confident in his scholarship. That just happened. But his role as a professor was to engage the community, the student community and the wider community in his discipline. And he worked overtime in building those networks of bringing people into the institution, of using the institute as a way of cultivating the careers and the networks. And importantly, I think for Alexander, this was not a, a thing for the University of Sydney, much as he loved the University of Sydney. It was for the Australian people. It was for the nation. He wanted to engage all of the universities and all of those students who had a love of classical antiquity and wished to advance that. So the whole point of the Institute was to be a national organisation. And yes, he was going to contribute and fund it and develop it, but he wanted to engage scholars from the 12 or so Institute members that are other universities in the country. He wanted to harness and build the careers of so many students. He really did value his engagement with students and making sure that their careers advance. People like Diana and Stavros and John Papadopoulos and Monica Jackson, wanting to open up doors, wanting to see their careers thrive. He took enormous pride in seeing other people's work um, flourish and thrive. And that's a contribution about professing the discipline and making sure um, that the discipline had um, a, a, a firm foundation, uh, uh, something that could flourish even after he passed. And that kind of professing the discipline, the quintessential classical professor of the old style about contributing to the nation. It's kind of an interesting um, insight that there was this man of Europe, particularly of Greece, and yet he fell in love with Australia. I mean, he did find his wonderful life partner in Australia, and that they were the power couple of the University of Sydney of the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. But he did develop a profound love of Australia and Australians and wanted to give back to the nation. And giving back to the nation was through the institute, through the university, through everything he did by nurturing the careers of so many bright young people um, for the future and ensuring that the study of classical antiquity would flourish um, in the Southern Hemisphere. And what a contribution and something that we as a group can all acknowledge. We may not be able to confer semi-deity um, to him, but we have portraits, we have his name on various plaques, um, and um, all of you here uh, are, is a recognition of his incredible contribution um, to the university and to Australia more generally. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Garten's presentation brings the formal proceedings to a close. Um, unfortunately, all our attendees um, through the live stream won't be able to um, uh, participate in the reception which we've organized um, and which will follow directly, but I hope everybody in McLaren Hall will be able to uh, stay back and have a glass of something and uh, possibly share their own reflections and memories of Alexander. I'd like to thank our speakers again, particularly um, those who have come from interstate um, and all of you uh, for attending uh, this afternoon. Um, I know that I speak for everybody from um, the Archaeological Institute that this public recognition of Alexander's great work um, unfortunately had to be delayed a number of times owing to the circumstances um, but we are very very pleased that we'll be that we were able to honor alexander today and of course um, it, this is not just uh, a one-day event um, 
as has been so eloquently um, displayed, I think, f from all the speakers this afternoon, um, Alexander's legacy and our gratitude for it will just keep on keeping on. So thank you very much.